Hello and welcome to Calvary Chapel Comic Key. Today is the 22nd of June 2020 and we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. Today will be chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. The title of the message today is Without and Far Away Until Verse 13. Let me read from verse 11 chapter 2. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called a circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So verse 13 is very encouraging. It's a reminder of who we were without Christ. We were without, and we were far away. So let's look at this verse by verse. Um, therefore, in verse 11, remember that you, once Gentiles. So remember, who is this written to? It's written to the Ephesians, and they were Gentiles. They were a very pagan city. They uh, worshiped their goddess Diana. You know, we read about that in the book of Acts, and you can uh, go back there and refer to that. But he's writing to mostly Gentiles here. So he says, as a reminder, you were once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Uh, so the Jews, they were very proud to call themselves the circumcision. Remember uh, the sign of the covenant with uh, Abraham. Uh, back in Genesis 15, God promises Abraham many things. And it says in verse 6 of chapter 15 that uh, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So it was by faith that he became right in the sight of God. It was through his faith. Uh, just like now, uh, how do we become right in the sight of a perfect God? It's by faith. It's, uh, we're saved by grace through faith. Um, it's by the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But Abraham had a righteous standing before God because of his faith. And then by chapter 17 of Genesis, when Abraham was 99 years old and Ishmael, the, the son of his flesh with the mother Hagar from Egypt, um, was commanded to now uh, perform this sign of that covenant. And that was the circumcision, the cutting away of flesh. But, you know, we see throughout Scripture, there's a higher spiritual definition about circumcision. It's, it's about the heart, and it's about a person uh, taking steps through faith in God to uh, turn his back on the world, to be separated from worldly, lustly, fleshly things, uh, and to take steps of faith trusting now God himself by the working of the Holy Spirit. So, so the sign of the covenant with Abraham was circumcision. And it says that uh, they were called the uncircumcision, the people there in Ephesus and all of us who are non-Jews by the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So that's just a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 12, and here it is. Uh, this is where I get the without and far away. Watch this that at that time, it is, you know, as you are uncircumcised in the flesh of even your heart, especially spiritually, that you are a, you are a Gentile without any hope um, um, because you're away from God. At that time, in verse 12, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So you're without a citizenship in a sense. Strangers from the covenant, so you're of promise, so you're without any covenant. See, that was all given to Israel. Uh, moving on, having no hope, so you're without hope and without God in the world. So you're trapped in the world, in the world system. Uh, you were a sinner trapped in sin and without hope, without all these things, without Christ. So, yeah. Um, the Ephesians were very religious. They had a false goddess. They had a temple uh, to serve the goddess Diana. They were without citizenship, unlike the Jews. Remember, Abram was called from uh, out of his country, uh, and the Lord was going to show him where he would give him this promised land, among other things. 
uh, and all these promises given to later on the Jews becoming a nation. So from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob becoming Israel, then the 12 tribes. They were uh, held in bondage in Egypt, a picture of the world. And then uh, through the servant Moses, uh, Moses leading them um, uh, through the exodus in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Now that whole first generation were disobedient in unbelief. And it was their children who became uh, partakers of the promised land. So not even Moses could go into the promised land at that point. And they were led in by um, Joshua. So that, that whole story. But see, all of that was to build a nation, God's special people of Israel. And, but it wasn't just to be for them. They were to be a light in a dark world, even to the Gentiles. We see that throughout the Old Testament. But they failed in many ways, just like every human does, because there's no human that can even keep the law of God, except for one, and that would be Jesus himself, God coming down to this earth, putting on flesh, and actually fulfilling the law perfectly, uh, without blame, you know, without blemish. He was the perfect lamb of God. So without citizenship, we see there in verse 12, uh, without the covenants we've talked about, I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, without hope, just as a reminder, without Christ, we are hopeless. Uh, and, and really, ultimately, we're loveless. We're unlovable. But because of God's love that is perfect, uh, being shown to us in the whole world through his one and only Son, and that perfect love coming into this broken world that is without hope, now we, we put on Christ. And so that's why it says in verse 13, but now in Christ. So we've learned up to this point in Ephesians that we have an identity in Christ. That's our identity. It's him living his life out in us. So now we are in Christ. So, so where it says, but now in Christ, those are beautiful words. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So I want to talk a little bit more about covenants. And uh, so in our Bible, we refer to uh, the first part of the Bible as the Old Testament. But do you know, Testament is just another word for covenant. So it's really the Old Covenant and then the New Covenant. Um, and so that brings up the point in our minds, well, then there must have been something wrong with the Old Covenant. And in general, um, the Old Covenant was based on what the people would do. In other words, if you do this, God would say, then I will do this. The New Covenant says, Kirk, you can't do that, so I've done that for you. So God says, I'm making a new covenant with who, whomever would come into my kingdom um, saved by grace through faith. There's this new covenant, and it's based on my finished work of what I've done for you. Now all you do is put your trust in that finished work. So that's why it's a better covenant. But let me, just as a reminder, you know, in the Gospels, uh, when we look at the passages about we, what we call the Last Supper, where Jesus is now eating with his disciples just before he goes to the cross, and, and they break bread, and it's a picture and a remembrance of his body, and then they drink the, the wine, the juice of the vine, and it's a picture of a remembrance of his shed blood. Now, the Last Supper was before he goes to the cross. Then after the cross, then um, the Apostle Paul, who had abundance of revelation knowledge from Christ, he speaks of the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But, it's, but Jesus and Paul refers to that as the blood of the new covenant. Let me read in 1 Corinthians 1.25. It says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so that reminds us in the Old Testament that in many ways when there was a covenant, um, uh, this binding agreement between God and his human creation, there was going to be shed blood. In fact, in Hebrews 9.22, I'm going to find that real quick. It says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, talks about the new covenant, and then 9 explains a little bit further. Uh, th that can be reading on your own. But uh, 
So if circumcision is the sign of the covenant uh, with Abraham and Abra Abraham coming to the Lord in faith, and so now there's this sign, this agreement, um, and so the sign is circumcision. Uh, remember way back in Genesis 15, God asked Abraham to gather these animals and then they were cut in two, so blood was shed. Uh, it's, it's before the law, hundreds of years before the law. You know, remember Moses represents the law and Abraham was way before Moses. Uh, and so in Hebrews, we're reminded that uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Remission is just another way of saying forgiveness. And so, so what about the new covenant? What is this, the sign of the new covenant? Well, we know that Jesus, his shed blood uh, was the covering the atonement that brings remission or forgiveness to anyone that it would apply it to their, their hearts and to their lives. Uh, but in a big sense, Jesus is actually the sign of the covenant because he, he being God himself coming to earth, he put on flesh, he put on a body, and he sacrificed willingly his body on that cross. And so in many ways, what is the sign of the new covenant? It's Jesus himself. He used his body, his human body, uh, in a sacrifice, and his blood was shed for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness. And it's also an atonement, a covering, uh, also uh, something that we see in precept uh, in the Old Testament. And so in the Old Testament, the sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats and sheep, you know, that was just a temporary covering, but it was a picture and a type of Jesus himself. So he became that perfect lamb of God without spot, without blemish, um, uh, the one that would shed his blood as a sacrifice for anyone and everyone that would put their faith in his finished work. And so, so covenant is, is a big precept in scripture. But today, you know, we see who we were as Gentiles without many things, without God, uh, without Christ, without any covenant. But see, God in his heart for his creation, he comes to this earth and now he takes care of that problem. And so by the way, as a reminder, in the Old Testament, um, as we go through you know, scripture of the Old Testament, especially with the prophets, and it's, it's really God's heart pleading through a human like Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel, please, Turn your back on your evil pagan ways. Don't do what I've begged you not to do. Don't go the way of the nations in their pagan worship and their sacrifices. Um, please come back to me. We even see in Jeremiah chapter three that the Lord is saying, um, he's begging, you know, uh, come back to me and I will, I will be your husband. And so in the Old Testament, Israel is known as the, the wife of Jehovah. And so in Jeremiah chapter three, there's a stern warning. Turn your back on the world, all the warnings I've given you. But you know, let's fast forward to right now in the present. We see this world is falling apart because of sin. And just like in the book of Judges, when Israel, they would be in this cycle. And it says that the people did what was right in their own eyes. And that got them into trouble every time. I see this world in the same mess. Every person is looking for their own uh, form of truth, the truth that works for them, the truth that they're comfortable with, you know, whether it be eternal things or just day-to-day -day life. But Jesus would say, wait a minute, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me. And so you might say, well, that's intolerant. That's what the world would say about uh, people who put their faith in Jesus. But Jesus himself said there's only one way to God the Father, and that's going to be through him. And so Jesus makes it very clear. And so this world is in turmoil because in, in many ways uh, we've turned our back on God. And so now let's, let's talk about the church, the worldwide church, the spiritual born again, alive and well in Christ's church. We have been placed here for such a time of, as this, to be a light in a dark place. And this world is very dark. So I just want to encourage you, be reminded uh, in verse 13, but now in Christ, you who once were far off, see that was us, 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, but that's not the end of it. We've been placed here uh, for a purpose. So those of us who have put our faith in Christ and we're new in him, a new creation, we have things to do, but especially to be a witness to the glory of Christ himself, to be a vessel used to bring people into the kingdom of God that lasts forever. Amen? Okay, so the title of the message is Without and Far Away. That's who we were. But then verse 13, I'll read again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And I say yes and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. And so be encouraged, be blessed. And until next time, God bless.